Okay, so since the EEOC is listening to this, thank you, first of all, for getting me offline there and kicking me off. And second of all, for giving me a little bit of a break. EEOC, you're watching this. Call me after four o'clock. Don't call me when I'm in the middle of my broadcast thinking that I'm gonna talk about something that you haven't investigated at all, like my constitutional rights and what Oakland University has to demonstrate. You sound angry. You think I'm upset? Do you think I'm upset that I have no cash coming in? Do you think I'm upset, EOC, investigator, whatever your name is? Yeah, I might be. And did you hear what I said? I'm going to own your entire university. I'm going to own your entire university as I take down every other university in this what size country that we've been lying to everybody about. Where is it? we own California or is that just another country? Are we waiting to get it blown up so that we really have a map of the world that's all spread out? Because I'm saying Florida doesn't look like Florida. When I go up in a plane, I don't see Florida, right? What's America trying to do? Nationalism right? Getting people angry and riled up for nationalism. All right. So what I started to say in the Mark Twain book was this, was that that top, the, the part that I was going to highlight was what that top 1% knew. And here's what the conversation was in the Mark Twain book. And this wraps everything up with this phone conversation that interrupted us and then getting kicked out because of poor streaming services that we pay for in what really is amounting to a communist country. So Mark Twain in his book, The Gilded Age, which is back where, where we were, right? The slave mentality you could tell by the vernacular, by the expression and, and the language is saying, now where is, now what state is Massachusetts in, right? So getting, because Twain gets the vernacular down. Now what state is Massachusetts in? And he's asking a um, Gilded Age person, right? Somebody who looks to be the part but as you get a little bit deeper into it, is not really the part. And he says, it's in Boston. What state is Massachusetts in? It's in Boston. Now, there are two ways that you could take that answer, right? You could take that answer as he knew the answer and didn't want to supply the black man with the information, possible. Absolutely possible. There definitely is a movement to make sure that people stay in their place by not having information. But there's also a second possibility. He either knew it was Boston was the wrong answer or he thought it was the right answer. So there's that possibility too. He knew it was the wrong answer and didn't give the black man the right answer or he didn't know that that was the wrong answer. That Massachusetts is the state. Boston is a city in Massachusetts, the state. He didn't know. Maybe he didn't know. In which case, that Gilded Era goes to show you it is just smoke and mirrors. And if you watch any George Carlin video, he's saying this whole system is smoke and mirrors. Now, I realize that that is what the Republican Party is saying as well. It's all smoke and mirrors. And the Dems aren't saying anything, right? So, what does that leave us? You throw your arms up and you say, I don't know what to do, right? Or, or, you just take the next best step. Right? Okay. So now remember what I was saying here, which was why I didn't vote Republican. 
And that is because the Republican national government took advantage of the wartime absence of Southern Democrats to push through a pro-business agenda. The Republican Congress gave millions of acres and dollars to railroad companies. So I did have on my um, LinkedIn, which I, I realize nobody does, but but you can't post, post this video or whatever you want, whatever. But there is a video from Eddie Murphy in Saturday Night Live where he dresses up in whiteface and goes into businesses and they give him everything. They're like, oh, it's okay. Nobody's, nobody's watching. And who has to make the money? The minorities and the women. Wouldn't that be funny if that was the real system? And why would that be so far from the truth? Since what we're seeing right here is, is that people were given money. We saw that MP Morgan, P, Pier, Piermont, whatever his name is, Pierpont, whatever his name is, got his money back from England. And it was running the banks, which were then giving out loans for war and railroads, taking the money back, giving them paper stocks and paper money. Where are the greenbacks over here? Because once again, aren't we still in greenbacks? Who gets the greenbacks? Oh, the minorities get the greenbacks. The white men get to trade their labor, right? They get to, they get to basically play the gambling game with the labor while the minorities all have to earn the greenbacks. Isn't that the way that it is? What? Nobody ever figured. I figured that out in about fifth. Whenever we had that lesson, I was like, what's in my, do you have a dollar? I, Kenny Church had a dollar. How is that not a greenback? Nobody answered the question. All smoke and mirrors. All smoke and mirrors. And what? <clears throat> Are the Dems about the smoke and mirrors because it's all Hollywood? The smoke and mirrors is all Hollywood? And so really, what? All of it's Hollywood? That's how bored you are? You'd rather have all the knowledge? I don't, right? Is that what it is? Sean Penn's over there helping out in New Orleans to promote his career. I happen to have a film crew filming these people on top of a house that looks exactly like the flood, but how'd I get this multi-cam pick? Sounds like communist China to me. Just looking for a stage show, right? Oh, boy. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. But what I do want to do is see this. There we go. I need to see this. All right. Now we got a perfect signal, don't we? Okay, so I'm still thinking about the EEOC jerk over there, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That was the phone call that I had over there, an investigator after all these months and didn't bother at all to even read the cover letter or do his homework about what he was supposed to be investigating. Simple case. I have to demonstrate my incompetence in three areas. Can't demonstrate the incompetence in three areas. Therefore, they have no right to ask me to take any kind of exam at all, especially with my kind of reputation that I've had there. None whatsoever. None. 
it's cut and dry. You want an easy case because you've got a lot of work to do and it's going to take you forever? Just look at what the requirements are for them to ask me to take that. That's it. I sound angry. One might be angry with your kind of incompetence, just as I said. And now it's on YouTube. Whatever your name was over there that was fake anyway. <clears throat> Okay, so we uh, so we read about William Jennings Bryan, and now oh, oh oh I remember what happened, and I didn't have this the, this highlighted, and it probably shut down, and I probably highlighted more again. So, born uh, Bryan was born in Salem, Illinois, in 1860 to a devout family with a strong passion for law, politics, and public speaking. At 20, he attended Union Law College in Chicago and passed the bar shortly thereafter. A after his marriage to Mary Baird in Illinois, Brian and his young family relocated to Nebraska, where he won a reputation among the state's Democratic Party leaders as an extraordinary orator. Brian later won recognition as one of the greatest speakers in American history. I wonder um, if I have got a... Oh, I did look him up. I did. There, I have no speeches by him. I'm pretty sure I looked him up. Here's our 501. Let's just take a quick peek. Maybe I didn't. But if he's one of the greatest orators ever in American history, you would think he might be in here. You would think he might. He might. Let's see. But I'm almost sure after our class, I looked it up. And I didn't find it, his name. And no. So, greatest orator in American history, not there. You know what I wonder if they have? Vic make you sick. Mmm. Look out, look out. You're getting, I mean, Victor McCusick. Was I pronouncing that wrong? Because it's spelled M-C-K-U-S-I-C-K. -I, I don't know, weird. And it's spelled V-I-C-K-S. I mean, V-I-C-T-O-R-S. That's what I meant. Victor. What's his middle name? No, nothing here from this Irish, what? I'm just assuming because of the Mick, right? That's all. I, I mean, he might not be Irish. And why do you have to make it a national thing, a nationalistic thing anyway, Dr. Fairovich? I know, that was horrible what I just did. It was. Take it back. When economic depression struck the Midwest in the late 1880s, despairing farmers, despairing farmers faced low crop prices and found few politicians on their side. While many rallied to the populist cause, Bryan worked from within the Democratic Party using the strength of his oratory. After delivering one speech, he told his wife, last night I found that I had a power over the audience. I can move them as I cho chose. I have more than you... I have more than usual power as a speaker. God grant that I may use it wisely. Now, you know, here we see, it is kind of interesting, isn't it, right? Because we see a sort of arrogance. But, but is this arrogance or is it recognition of his talents? I don't know.
I mean, I don't think that there is anything wrong with noticing that you can move an audience And the, in, in, in powerful ways, right? I don't think that there's anything wrong with you knowing and recognizing that you can move an audience in powerful ways. I would think, however, that there would be something wrong if you wanted to use it for your own purposes. And that's what I think is the difference here between the Republican Party and here he is continuing to stay with the from working within the Democratic Party. So this is what to me as I was growing up was always the distinct difference between the Republican and Democratic Party. It was they both have powers. One was using it to service themselves in the railroad community very clearly in the banks very clearly. And the other one was very clearly in this quote. Now, I don't know if this quote is true, but there is a site there. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to Take this arrow from here. And draw it here. So is this arrogance or a recognition of talent? And again, I think the difference is, is in the comment there, God grant that I may use it wisely. We are not seeing those kind of comments from... The Republican Party here, this is just so key. I've got to put it in a different color because, actually not that one though. I'm going to put that in. It makes me very, very blue. blue. So that is so key to who the Republicans are in my point of view. And this has been key. Now, whether or not it is, it is true... I'm not sure, right? Or if it's true of every Democrat, I probably not. I, I would bet, I would be almost certain to say no. But these are, because, and so that's the reason why you have to look at individuals of parties and what do they stand for. If they are saying things like, I am going to be a dictator. Well, then you know what you voted for. You voted for a dictator. And I just happen to think that the person who says I might be a dictator is trying to find out if you're going to vote for him. And I have a feeling he's going to come down hard on all of you. But you don't, you don't think so. That's okay. I do. He soon won election to the House of Representatives where he served for two terms. Although he lost a bid to join the Senate, Bryan turned his attention to a higher position, the presidency of the United States. There he believed he could change a country by defending farmers and urban laborers against the corruption of big business. In, 1990, in 1895 to 1896, Brian Loss launched a national speaking tour in which he promoted the free coinage of silver. He believed that bimetallism, by inflating American currency, could alleviate farmers' debts. In contrast, Republicans championed the gold standard and a flat 
flat money supply. American monetary standards became a leading campaign issue. Then in July, 1896, the Democratic Party's National Convention met to choose their presidential nominee in the upcoming election. The party platform asserted that gold, that the gold standard was not only un-American, but anti-American. Oh my gosh. Well, that's going to set them in trouble, isn't it? Since that's all that Americans want, isn't it? Is what? The only thing Americans want is the gold standard. And now you can see that both gold and silver prices are being manipulated, just like all other monetary money. Who needs it? We don't need money. We need services is what we need. That's what we need, not money. When did a metal get elevated to the gold standard? And this by far is going to be Brian's demise because what did they promote in the Gilded Era? They promoted a gold standard, didn't they? There we go. So what do they promote in the Gilded Era or the Gilded Age? I'm going to put the Gilded Age there. Pete's sake. So what do they promote? The Gold Standard. So I'm saying he's going to have a hard time. Brian's going to have a hard time in his campaign because what did the Gilded Age promote? A gold standard. And what did Brian want? He wanted, oh my gosh, this is so incredible. Oh, bimetallism, that's what that word is. He believed that bimetallism, by inflating American currency, could alleviate debts. So what was that? I can't see what, what that was. The, he promoted the free coinage of silver. So didn't the farmers have silver? That's what the farmers were given, weren't they? And then they deflated the price of silver. That's what that's about. All that Brian was saying was that if you're going to, if you are going to inflate the price of gold to make these people rich, the rich even richer, why don't you inflate the price of silver, which they gave to the farmers as recompense, as their reward for their turning in their stocks. They gave them silver and they devalued the silver. Now, again, I'm learning with you, right? So, so there needs to be people who are doing deeper dives and let me know if I've got something wrong here, right? Because not everything is, again, a lot of this stuff I'm putting together and the reason why I'm putting together here for you is because so much of the stuff, clearly we need to read between the lines. Are we really just walled off? from the rest of the world? And does the rest of the world start where? Just past Chicago? <laughs> Who's South Korea and North Korea? <laughs> That's what I want to know.
Okay, so. The gold standard was not only un-American, but anti-American. Absolutely. Brian spoke last at the convention. He astounded his listeners. At the conclusion of his stirring speech, he declared, having behind us the commercial interests and laboring interests and all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind under a cross of gold. After a few seconds of stunned silence, the convention went wild. Some wept. Many shouted, and the, began, and the band began to play, for he's a jolly good fellow. Brian received the, 19, the 1896 Democratic presidential nomination. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? I would have to say so. So, folks, that's what buying gold has been doing. It's, it's, it's just inflated, and they gave silver some inflation to try, and, to try and, you know, quiet the masses, but nothing like the gold inflation, and now we see silver is almost worthless again. The Republican ran William McKinley, an economist conservative who championed business interests and the gold standard. Brian crisscrossed the country spreading the silver gospel. The, the election drew enormous attention and much emotion. According to Brian's wife, he received 2,000 letters of support every day that year, an enormous amount for any politician, let alone one not currently in office. Yet Brian could not defeat McKinley. The pro-business Republicans outspent Brian's campaign fivefold. A notably high 79.3% of eligible American voters cast ballots and turnout averaged 90% in areas supportive of Bryan, but Republicans swayed the population dense Northeast and Great Lakes region and stymied the Democrats. So here you see our very first corrupt election. So another thing that um, Trump is pointing out, corrupt elections have been happening for a very long time and we've been accepting them. And oh, by the way, we started accepting them with the Republicans. In early 1900, Congress passed the Gold Standard Act, which put the country, and remember, who's Congress? Congress is all Republicans because we barely have got anyone really, um, uh, um, organized enough from the South, from the Southern Democrats, right? Uh, so, yeah, so the Republicans are able to sway the population dense Northeast. And a lot of people went to the North for a lot of reasons to get out of slavery, right? So now you've got a population dense North. They're looking fine up there, aren't they? Giving you jobs, right? So looking really good, but low paying jobs that don't amount to anything. In early, and those are Republicans, by the way, who are running businesses who are doing that. They want to put it on uh, Biden's bill. But this has been a Republican um, tenant. This has been part of their foundation, part of their platform since clearly after the Civil War. Prosperity right there. Conservative William McKinley promised prosperity to ordinary Americans, and that is the Gilded Age. Through his Sound Money Initiative, a policy he ran on during his election campaign in 1896 and again in 1900, this election poster touts McKinley's gold standard policy as bringing prosperity at home, prestige abroad. Prosperity at home, prestige abroad. Oh, that's a, the title of, of that, right? 1895 and 1900, Library of Congress.
Bryan sought the presidency again in 1900, but was again defeated as he would be yet again in 1908. With all that popularity and defeated again and again. Bryan was among the most influential losers in American political history. When the aggr when the agrarian wing of the Democratic Party nominated the Nebraska congressman in 1896, Bryan's fiery condemnation of the Northeastern financial interests and his impassioned calls for free and unlimited coinage of silver co-opted popular populist issues. The Democrats stood steady stood ready to siphon off a large portion of the populist political support. When the People's Party held its own convention two weeks later, the party's moderate ring in a fiercely contested move overrode the objections of more ideologically pure populists and nominated Bryan as the populist candidate as well. This strategy of temporary fusion movement fatally fractured the movement and the party. Populist energy moved from the radical yet still weak People's Party to the moderate yet powerful Democratic Party. All right, so... It's so interesting that he's got populist views here as well as Democratic view, Party views. And they are, they're, this fusion fatally fractured the movement and the party. So they just didn't want any part of it, right? If they didn't like the Democrats, the populists were going to go forget you. Democrats didn't like the populists, they're going to say forget you. And then, then, so the vote's going to go to the, and, and that has always been, honestly, the power of the Democratic, uh, of the Republican Party. Always been the power of the Republican Party, that no matter what, you vote together. Where Democrats have really been known to split because of issues. And that split is not favorable when you're trying to win an election. Right? That, that split in the party is not favorable when you're trying to win an election. And although at first glance the populist movement appears to have been a failure, its minor electoral gains were short-lived. It did little to dislodge the entrenched, entrenched two-party system, and the populist dream of a cooperative commonwealth never took shape. In terms of lasting impact, the populist party proved the most significant third-party movement in American history. I think that might be maybe till the libertarians. I'm not sure, but... but this was written, you know, since Libertarian. So the agrarian revolt established the roots of later reform and the majority of politics outlined within the Omaha platform would eventually put into, be put into law over the following decades under the management of middle-class reformers. In large measure, the populist vision laid the intellectual groundwork for the coming progressive movement. Now that's interesting there as well, because if that's true, what they're saying is, is it was the left that the, the left of the left, right? So they were radical. The populist movement was the radical left and they were trying to devour the Democrat. They were essentially devouring the Democratic Party is what they were doing for their leftist views. These leftist views from the populist vision ended up becoming if that's true that that populist vision laid the intellectual groundwork for the coming progressive movement, then it was definitely the radical left from this perspective 
that led to, wait, why don't you do what you're supposed to do? Fascism. That's why That's why the left, that's why the right blames the left for fascism. It was the radical left that, that started this intellectual movement. And in, and, and might I say, I can see that that is true. No, oh, I hate when this does that. We're back again where we were before. All right, we are out of time anyway. Uh, and, and it looks like this might shut down again. And this is going to be maybe the third time that the preview shut down after I highlighted. I, I don't know. I might have read all that part before, but it was definitely worth repeating. And now I can't get back to the rest of it because it's, I don't know, the machine. I think I've got a memory thing going on here. And it's probably because I've got too many things open. So I've got to close a lot of these things. Um, all right, so this is Dr. Not Fairwitch. Thanks for joining me here in the classroom. What happened there? Yeah, preview just shut down again. Oh, now I'm going to have to do those highlights again. I just look at all the colors I had on those highlights. They don't automatically save them. It's so disappointing. This is Dr. Not Fairwitch getting frustrated at technology. You know what I say to technology? You know what? You're going to be out of here pretty soon. All you're doing is frustrating the minorities in the masses. Ugh. Okay. All right. Dr. Not Farage, thanks for joining me. I'll be back here in engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit. I got a little work to do there too, so I might be a little late. All right. Catch you in a few. Thanks for joining me.